Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me here today. And I hope they won't regret it. I'm here to talk about how do we educate for the digital era and so on. The trouble is that I don't think we should. None of the organizers fainted. That's good. But it's not because I'm too old fashioned. No, quite the opposite. That's not enough. Why should we educate for industry 4.0 and not 6.0 or 10.0? I think that we should educate for the future. Because children, students will live mainly in the future. And what I just said is either completely trivial, and everyone knows that, or it's, wow, a profound, life-changing piece of knowledge, or it's a lie, and we should suppress it. So which do you think? Well, depending on the position of our society, it seems to be that the last is true. It's, it's a lie, because what are the arguments concerning education? Some people say, well, back when I went to school, or I never needed this or that, and it was useless learning that, or, and that's not much better, companies today need X, Y, Z, we need more drivers. Yesterday it was minors. We really should be careful about that. We should not start listening to companies when we deal with education, because their specific needs don't they realize that education takes years 10 or 20 years like who cares that you don't have drivers today if you change the curriculum the first drivers you get are in 20 years and there won't be any drivers in 20 years and that's not a joke it's not so long ago that mining was introduced as a an education program with huge support from companies and even before they finish studying, we close all the mines. But the organizers, I think, meant it well when they invited me. Let's teach at least for 4.0. And not for Empress Maria Theresa from the 18th century. That's probably what they meant, OK? These are my grandchildren. Unless something unexpected happens, they will probably be alive in the year 2100. And I really want us to give them an education that will last for that long, to make them protected, future-proof them for whatever happens. We should keep that in mind at the very least. If we talk about whether we should teach them the Pythagoras theorem or whatever, Perhaps this wasn't as important in the past, but today it's extremely important. The future is not what it used to be. Everything is changing so quickly. We know nothing about the future. And, but we don't think that will be a huge wave of digitalization and then for 100 years, nothing. No one even considers that. It's going to look like this. Every 20 years, we have another revolution of some kind, and everything will be completely overwritten once again. And if you're not able to reinvent yourself every single time, as Harari says, you'll be in trouble, and the others will be in trouble. Because you have people demonstrating in the streets. We can see it today. We wouldn't be in this state of social panic if that we are if the people received a proper education back then. It's not easy to reinvent yourself. So the world of the future will be completely different than today. We have no idea what it's going to be like. So how are we supposed to educate our children for that? Well, surprisingly, I think this is quite enough. This is quite enough for a clever education program, because if we don't know what they need, so let's educate them with in, in things that are always useful. And there are so many of those. And I have an hour-long lecture on this topic, so I'm not going to go into that. But here I have some slides from that. So th 
thinking, making things. Uh, those are things worth developing. Flexibility. People forget about that. We've heard it today. Teachers don't want to change. And some people do want to change. And they keep buying new software versions of everything, and some don't even want a computer. Whatever this is not your natural characteristic, it's not a personality trait. It's a skill that you can develop. Maybe all you had to do was to tell the people at the start, you won't be a miner for your entire life. For a while, I'll be a miner, then I'll be something else entirely. And knowing this would have helped. Of course, creating the future is much easier than adapting to the future. If you create the future, others have to adapt. Understanding the world, that's clear. Understanding yourself, that's extremely important. Again, Harari, if you don't understand yourself, then artificial intelligence or bad-meaning people will wipe the floor with you. Again, if the demonstrators understood themselves, they wouldn't be caught by those fraudsters. I'm bad with this clicker thing. Anyway, to sum it up, technology impacts education in many ways, but most importantly, indirectly, because it changes the world around us. And this means that we have to change the targets of education and methods, because the objective of education has to be to make the children future-proof. But thankfully, technologies can help a lot. The risks are associated with that, and we've talked about that. Here's a nice example of being afraid of technology. My eyesight is bad because I read too much. It's true, I shouldn't have read so much. But the greatest risk, and we haven't heard that in the previous panel, the greatest risk is that education will not change at all. Surprisingly, the Finnish Minister of Education knows that. I'm happy to have heard, but I sort of knew. But here, no one knows what kind of trouble we are heading to. Because we are still teaching children in the same stupid old manner. Now about technology. Anyone understands all these buzzwords? Do you? Really? I'll try to say it in my own words. We've had this report presented. There are so many things, and everything that's in there is correct. But sometimes it's not the typical things. It's simple, industry. Industry is very easy. The industrial revolutions are clearly delineated. You can tell which one is which. Each of them completely overthrew everything in industry. Perhaps not the last one, because Industry 4.0, that's not 3D printers and more robots and that kind of thing. That's true, yes, but that's not the defining feature. The defining feature is that this is digital manufacturing. That's what makes things different. Digital, digital twin, that's a key concept, there, a digital twin. I'll give you an example. You're invited to a party in the evening, it's the afternoon, you don't have the proper dress. You say, OK, I still have an hour to go, so you design a dress, you pick one on the internet, you pick the pick the fabric in the computer, you have your digi the digital mod copy of your body, including how it moves. So you can put it on in a simulation, you find out it's looking pretty great, so you send it to the factory. In the factory, they add, add digital models of the materials it's supposed to be made from, and digital models of the machinery that they have, and from all of that, you create a digital twin of the future product. It's just a model and the whole process behind it. And now the twin goes through the factory. There are no lines, nothing like that. Here they saw on a button. Here it gets a zipper. OK, I'm, I'm making fun of this. But in one hour, you have the courier, and there's your dress. This can do so many things. This can change so many things. Custom production at the price of mass production. A market for just one person. Every customer is a brand new customer. The factory needs to be next door. Ultimately, it will be in your home. You can't take a new dress, ship a new dress from China to here in one hour. That's not possible. 
and it becomes much more important to design things because making things becomes easy. That's the trivial part of it. How much time do I have left? And what's Industry 2.0, 5.0? I have no idea, but I can tell you, suggest perhaps. Information have been digitalized for some time and it's causing all this chaos we have. So what if we now digitalize matter? Now we're trying to do things like that. We have matter that's made up of bits, which in these cases are these units of material, these building blocks that are all the same and you reconfigure them to create a complicated product. The new material can have properties that no current material has. On the left, you, these are images from MIT. On the right, that's a robot, Zhuzhou, developed by our boys. It's made from these, uh, these cubes, and it moves by changing the shapes of these cubes. And as they change the shape, it sort of flows around like an amoeba. So that's an example. Another example, I'm not good at this clicker thing. The second example is shaping a field. Okay, the video doesn't work. Imagine you have so many many balls or cells and you want to arrange them with artificial insemination or whatever. And imagine you create this artificial landscape with hills and valleys and you have the balls in there and they will go thanks to gravity, wherever you need them to be. So that's what we've been trying to do. But we don't do, of course, change gravity, but we can do the other things. So we have magnetic magnets and electricity and acoustics and magnet hydrodynamics, contact glass manipulation, whatever. And you can arrange 100 balls however you need to. This could be quite useful in digital matter. And it could even build itself. You just program it. You throw the cubes on the floor and they sh form themselves into a car. I'm exaggerating, but it's not impossible. Information revolution, we've heard that. We've, and it's been here before. This is the second information revolution. The first one after Gutenberg. So we can learn from the mistakes, but it turns out we're unable to do that. Back then, the world became much more complicated for people. Then there was a hundred years of wars. Immediately we started splitting into us and them, and there was a, a schism and widespread murder for a hundred years. And then we had humanism and the Renaissance and Industrial Revolution, and we wouldn't have any of that without this. And let's hope that this revolution won't be quite as bloody and the transition won't take so long. And now, now the clicker doesn't work. Education. Okay, we all we can all agree that Education 1.0, that's Empress Maria Theresa, introduced mandatory school education in the Czech lands. And the second picture, that's last week. I just turned it a bit brown. So what happened? Education was just at school. The teacher was in charge of everything, who tells you things, tells the students things, and the students remember. One size fits all. Please raise your hand if you have two or more children. May I ask discreetly, can you tell them apart? You don't have to label them one and two. Every child is different. We all know that. But our educational system somehow doesn't. There's just one school leaving exam, one entrance exam. By the way, what happened this year with the entrance exams to secondary schools, that's criminal, honestly. So many talented children could not get to a secondary school, but okay, I'm not going to talk about that now. And the education that we're talking about, whatever number you put on it, I like 4.0, because as I'll show you in a minute, it has a similar character as industry 4.0, but I don't know what the two and three were in that case, no one knows. Oh, let's say the internet, okay, web 3.0, so internet through, so education 3.0, some say education 2.0, which would make sense. Okay, I found all of these. What makes it all similar to the product? Remember what I told you about the product. 
children are in the center of things. Children are in charge of everything, like the digital twin in the factory. You communicate in all directions. Children between themselves is extremely important. It's active. It's tailored. These, this is all similar to Industry 4.0. And what's also important, the customer is the child. Why should we listen to companies in education, or the state, or the army, or whoever? The child is your customer. You're giving the child the skills they will need for the future. Please take this clicking off my time, because it's a loss of time. Virtual reality. I'm going to love virtual reality. But I think I want it to be more tactile, so I can like disassemble a submarine or a running nuclear reactor. That would be fun. But this aspect of the social aspect is very important. We actually encountered this at university because during COVID, I mean, remote lectures, that's easy. I mean, that's pretty much what we've always done. Even lab exercises, we could do that. We came up with the idea of a home lab, lots of small experiments. Everyone ran their experiments at home, sent their videos to the teacher. But what we could not have was contact between students, which I'll create the pedagogy researchers because now we physicists have to do this. One Nobel, Nobel Prize laureate for physics started teaching physics and used hard data to show that the progress in university between a boring teacher and this kind of superstar and experiments at lectures, that's just a tiny difference. What makes a difference is discussion among students. They argue with each other. That's not how it is. That's how it is. That's what makes progress happen. Augmented reality, OK, I'm skip that. I'm probably, I've probably run out of time. But we've done that for one car maker. Gamification, well, that's a great thing. And I've heard that it's science fiction. Ladies and gentlemen, no. Comenius came up with that so many hundreds of years ago. And it's still science fiction. We really deserve to be wiped out by aliens, honestly. We can't do it like this. And we're still talking about technologies that were originally invented for something else entirely, but can be also used in education. So where are all these pedagogical innovations? Psychology, sociology. Tell me of a, a revolutionary invention since Comenius. When we have that, we'll have Education 5.0. Still doesn't work. OK, uh, of course, technology will be using technology. But the technology is not the aim. It's not the end goal. And technically, universities should know this, but they don't. Technically, universities are so behind the times. So by the time the students graduate, everything they've learned is already outdated. That's how it is. Bob, I'm out of time, am I not? OK, one more thing. OK, two slides, two slides. Typical, uh, our Czech technological university says, we teach the, mo the latest technology. No, we teach technologies that don't even exist yet. We teach you to invent them. Here's your proof. When you accredit, need to accredit a student program, you need to provide the profile of a graduate. This is where you define what the person can do, what you turn them into. A typical Czech school, and this is a specific one, says that the engineer graduate will be able to program in C++, use Laplace transformation, and create a knowledge base for the NPS32 expert system. I have no idea what that is. I would go to a school like that. What we have is, what we do is we raise engineers. And whatever they do, and they can do literally anything, they will approach it as an engineer. And that's very important. And if you don't think so, that's why I have this image on the bottom left. Now, very quickly, there are other important characteristics the impact of graduates of the best university is not felt in their field and in their inventions, but in what the, their team does. They need to be versatile. They need to be. They need to want to change the world. That's what I always say. 
if you want a good job and make serious money, go study somewhere else. If you want to change the world, come here. And we have so much data, with the exception of education, at least in the Czech Republic. I don't know almost any. Even, John, sorry, but even your study doesn't actually research true data. You're just looking at what others wrote about this. It could have been nonsense. I mean, no, you did a good job. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> you did a good job, but I'm the STEM guy here, OK? Because, you know, this was written by the humanities people. Look at articles written by physicists or engineers. But OK, that's my small dig there. But education is here for the future. Sorry, John. That's it. Thank you very much.